Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, I'm going to be covering pediatric um, increased intracranial pressure, and I'm also going to be covering pediatric altered mental status. Now, before we get started, I'm going to ask you to please support this channel. You can do that by liking this video. You're going to love it. Go ahead, press that like button now so you don't forget. Subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already. Interact with me and other students in the comment section because that really helps the algorithm. It helps um, my videos show up uh, as suggestions on more people's pages. And of course, I have audio lessons available on my website nexusnursinginstitute.com. So guys, let's get started. We're going to start with increased intracranial pressure. Now look what it says. It says an increase in intracranial pressure. That's what ICP is. It can be caused by tumor. And it makes sense, guys, because if the patient has a tumor, that tumor is occupying space. So it absolutely can increase the pressure in the patient's um, cranium or other space occupying uh, lesions. Accumulation of fluid within the ventricular system, bleeding, edema of cerebral tissues. Edema of cerebral tissues, that's basically swelling, right? So all of these can cause the patient to have increased intracranial pressure. Again, tumors, other uh, space-occupying lesions, accumulation of fluid, uh, bleeding, or edema of cerebral tissues. The early signs and symptoms of increased intracranial pressure, you guys have to know those signs and symptoms. Headache, vomit, vomiting, personality changes, irritability, fatigue. And sometimes these symptoms are often subtle, but think about it. If the patient had trauma to their head, they were an MVA, something happened guys, that there was a possible brain in, um, injury. And all of a sudden you're seeing that patient who used to be nice and kind, mean, or they're having excessive vomiting or a bad headache or fatigue. One of those things that need to be in the back of your mind, you need to be suspecting is increased intracranial pressure. Now look at what it says. In older children, subjective symptoms are headache, especially upon arising or lying flat, such as waking up in the morning, all of a sudden they have a headache. They may have double vision or blurred vision. Seizures can occur. Now let's take a look at uh, evaluation of neurological status assessment, general aspects. Children younger than two years of age require special evaluation. Let me stop right there. Think about it, guys. If they're younger than two, are they gonna tell you that they have a headache? Or you know, will those personality changes be as pronounced as they would be in older children? So it makes sense, guys. When they're younger than two, you're going to have to monitor them and assess them a lot closer, okay? They require special evaluation because they're unable to respond to directions uh, designed to elicit uh, specific neurologic responses. Now, let's look at these clinical manifestations, signs and symptoms of um, children with increased intracranial pressure. Now, there's a whole list of them, but what I did was I underlined the ones that tend to show up the most for testing purposes. And if I put a star next to it, that uh, tends to show up the most, the most for not only t um, normal, you know, nursing exams, but the big exams such as HESI, ATI, and of course, NCLEX. So let's take a look, guys. Separated cranial sutures. Now look, guys, those cranial sutures are supposed to be like this. I hope you can see my hands, but you see them separated. What do you think is separating them? All of that pressure, whatever it is that's causing the pressure. Uh, McEwen, that's the crackpot sign. High-pitched cry, that's a biggie. Increased frontal occipital circumference. Setting sun sign, headache. Diplopia, blurred vision, seizures, a drowsiness, increased sleeping, inability to follow simple commands. Sorry, guys. Let's take a look at um, altered states of consciousness. The first thing I want to bring to your attention is this nursing alert. It says a lack of response to painful stimuli is abnormal and must be reported immediately. Now, give me one second, guys. I'm going to have to pause this for a moment. Okay, guys, so I'm back. Take a look. A lack of response to painful stimuli is abnormal. It must be reported immediately. So when you do something to hurt someone, you pinch them, what are they automatically? What do they do? They're supposed to withdraw from that 
painful stimuli. So what they're saying is, especially a child, if they do not respond to that painful stimuli, you have to report that to the healthcare provider immediately. All right, let's look at level, uh, level of consciousness. Assessment of level of consciousness remains the earliest indicator of improvement or deterioration in the neurological status. So neurologically speaking, the way we know that the first sign to let us know that that patient's getting better or that they're getting worse is their level of consciousness. How aware are they? So let's take a look when it comes to level of consciousness, guys, the um, standardized measurement, okay, is going to be your Glasgow Coma Scale. Take a look. It says the standardized description and interpretation of the degree of depressed consciousness, the Glasgow Coma Scale consists of three part assessment. What are those three parts? Eye opening, verbal response, and motor response. The Glasgow Coma Scale was created to meet a clinical need to identify criteria for consciousness level. And the great thing about the Glasgow Coma Scale, guys, you can be in Kentucky and another nurse is in New York or Florida or Texas or California, and they should be able to have an idea, uh, neurologically speaking, what that patient looks like. This is standardized. So I'm not going to read all of this, the rest, but the most important thing you need to know about the Glasgow Coma Scale, the best you can do, okay, is going to be a 15. The worst you can do is going to be a three. Anything eight or less, that patient's in a coma. So the lower the number is, the worse that patient is off. And then the, the higher the number is, the better that patient is, okay? Three the worst, 15 the best, eight or less, patient's in a coma. Make sure you know that. And again, this is um, uh, the pediatric coma scale the eyes opening, best motor response, and best response to auditory and or visual stimulus. Let's look at vital signs. Uh, before I go to vital signs, something else I want to bring to your attention just very quickly. Uh, NCLEX does ask about, has asked about this before. So you do need to know that when it comes to um, description and interpretation of consciousness is going to be the Glasgow Coma Scale. And you need to know the three parts. All right, now moving on. Let's do vital signs. Body temperatures often elevated, sometimes the elevation's extreme. The pulse is variable. It could be rapid, slow, bounding, or it could be feeble. Blood pressure can be normal, elevated, or very low. For assessment purposes, look at this, guys. Let me make this a little bit larger for you. For assessment purposes, actual changes in the pulse and blood pressure are more important than the direction of the change. So the fact that we have a change in that pulse and blood pressure, that means more and tells us more than whether that pulse is going up or down or the blood pressure is going up or down. Respirations are often slow, deep, irregular. Slow and deep breathing often occurs in the heavy sleep that's caused by sedatives. The patient's on some type of opioid. After seizures, remember guys, after a patient has a seizure, they are exhausted. Remember one of the things I taught you after a patient has a seizure, you know, especially when it comes to children, you want them to socialize, but after a seizure, you have to allow them to sleep because they're going to be extremely fatigued, right? After seizures or in cerebral infections. Slow, shallow breathing may result from sedatives or opioids. This is the second time we're seeing this. Hyperventilation, deep and rapid respirations, is often the result of metabolic acidosis. Let's stop right there. That makes sense. Think about it. Metabolic acidosis. Patients got um, all this acidity in their body. They need to breathe it off. What are they going to do? <sighs> They're going to be breathing off that CO2 because remember, CO2 is what? Acidic. Okay, or abnormal stimulation of the respiratory center in the medulla. Let's stop right there. You guys learned about this in A&P. Don't forget it. It's important for you to know that respiratory center that tells you how fast to breathe, the rate of and depth of the, your, what your breathing should be. It's in the brain and more specifically in the medulla. Okay, 
let's keep going, caused by solicited poisoning, hepatic coma, or Ray syndrome. A pattern of alternating hyperventilation and breath holding during wakefulness is common in Rett syndrome. All right, let's move on to the eyes. You're going to assess the pupil's size and reactivity. Pupils either do or do not react to light. They're either going to react or they're not going to react to light. Pinpoint pupils are commonly observed in poisoning, such as opioid or barbiturate poisoning, or in brainstem dysfunction. And you guys um, are going to learn more about this in a little bit. This is no bueno when you see brainstem dysfunction. Bilateral, so both, bilateral fixed pupils, if present for more than five minutes, usually implies brainstem damage, okay? This is a medical emergency. We don't have time to waste. The sudden appearance of a fixed and dilated pupil is a neurosurgical emergency. Okay, eye movements. Eye movements are assessed by the doll's head maneuver. And um, something important you guys need to understand in regards to the doll's head remover, um, doll's head maneuver is this. Absence of this response suggests dysfunction of the brainstem or the cranial nerve three. Another test is a, a um the excuse me, the caloric test, fundoscopic examination. Let's, let's take a look at these two nursing alerts. Any tests that requires head movement are not attempted until after cervical spine injury has been ruled out. Imagine you're doing a, you're doing a test on that patient that requires head movement, but that patient had a cervical injury. Now you cause them to be paralyzed or you worsen the condition. So you absolutely have to make sure that a cervical spine injury has been ruled out before you do any test that would require them to move their head. Another nursing alert. The ice water caloric test is painful and it's never performed if the child's awake or the tympanic membranes have been ruptured. Now let's take a look at motor function. Observation of spontaneous activity, posture, and response to painful stimuli provides clues to the location and extent of the cerebral dysfunction. Asymmetric movements, that means just movements on one side, guys or without movement on one side. Asymmetric movements of the limbs or absence of movement suggests that the patient's paralyzed. I want you to take a look at these two pictures because NCLEX expects you to know the difference between the two and they also expect you to know which one's worse, okay? So you have the corticate and you have decibrate. This one's the corticate. This one's known as the flexion posturing. This is the most dangerous. That's why I put a sad face next to it, okay? When it comes to the corticate posturing, most likely the brainstem's been involved, okay? The prognosis is not, is not good. Now, desperate posturing, this is extension posturing. Look at, um, look at how the body's positioned. Make sure that you know the difference. Now take a look, flexion posturing. Again, guys, this is the corticate. This is the one that's most dangerous. This is the one that suggests that the brainstem's been involved. Flexion posturing occurs with severe dysfunction of the cerebral cortex or with lesions to cortical, um, cortical spinal tracts above the brainstem. Typical flexion posturing includes rigid flexion of the arms. And you can see that right here, they're flexing the arms, right? Rigid flexing of the arms held tightly to the body, flexed elbows, wrists, and fingers, plantar flexed feet, you can see that, legs extended and internally rotated, and possibly fine tremors or intense stiffness. I'm sorry, you can even see what I was reading. Right here, what I have in orange, okay? That's what I just read to you. And that is the first picture, the one that is most dangerous. Now, the second one, the desperate, that's what's known as extension posturing. Extension posturing, this is a sign of dysfunction at the level of the midbrain or lesions to the um, brainstem. It's characterized by rigid extension and pronation of the arms, legs, flex, wrists, and fingers, 
clenched jaw, extended neck, and possibly arched back. Posturing may not be evident when the child is quiet, but can usually be elicited by applying what kind of stimuli, guys? Painful stimuli, such as blunt object pressed on the base of the nail. Nurses should avoid applying thumb pressure to the supraorbital region of the frontal bone because you don't want to cause um, orbital damage. Noxious stimuli, such as suctioning, turning, touching, will elicit such a response. You guys need to know examples of noxious stimuli, by the way. When the nurse is describing posturing, the stimulus needed to provoke the response is as important as the reaction. So when you're documenting, not only do you document that patient's reaction to the painful um, stimuli, you have to also document what type of painful stimuli you used, okay? Now, reflexes. Oh, I'm not reading all of that. Just know, when it comes to reflexes, look what I wrote. Reflexes expected to be seen in infants. Here's the list. We expect to see Moreau, tonic neck withdrawal reflexes. Those are reflexes we expect to see in the infant. Make sure you guys know them. All right, guys, there's definitely going to be a part two because I've got lots more to cover, including seizures and the precautions. But please let me know what you guys thought about this video. Let me know what you'd like to see me cover in depth. Don't forget Sundays, one o'clock Eastern Standard Time. I um, have a video release where I cover questions and teach you how to answer the questions appropriately. Don't forget that Sunday, October 30th, 2022. I have to say that because it might be two years from now. So I might be watching this video. So Sunday, October uh, 30th, 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 2022. I am providing a free, absolutely free NCLEX review. It's going to be on YouTube live and YouTube live, and I'm going to be continuing my priority and delegation series. So guys, make sure you check that out. Don't forget, I have audio lessons available on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. Thank you so much for watching this video. You guys will catch me on the next video.